Welcome back to ADHD with me, Travis Mills. I got Johnny Pemberton on the podcast today. What's up, dude? Hey! <laughs> uh, right before the mics cut on, we were talking about metal. And yeah. uh, I just recently found myself working out to a lot of old Slipknot uh, in Converge. Okay. Are you a Converge fan at all? Not so much. I mean, I like a lot of the older thrash stuff. Like, I really, uh, I got really into Pantera. Okay. <laughs> I love Pantera. I love Power Trip is my favorite band right now. You're putting me on right now. Power trip, obituary. I see the hat. But they're more death. Okay. Uh, I used to DJ at this radio station in co in college at, at Florida State, and they uh, I don't know if you know, but Florida has the most metal bands. Like definitely. And I think that the college. I feel like Florida has the most metal people. Everything about Florida is the most metal. <laughs> so obituary is from Florida. There's a bunch of other bands I don't even know. I'm, I'm not like a, a true metal head, but I used to DJ this spot from two to 6 a.m. at the radio station that was right after the metal show. And every time I go on there, they would fuck with me because I look like this little like innocent, like, oh, hi, it's me, little, little indie boy. So they would purposefully play the, the songs with the worst titles. So I had to go on and back announce, be like, hey, uh, it's now it's 2 a.m. It's in WVFS Tallahassee. And uh, you just heard someone from Dying Fetus that was a bloody altar yeah. death, <laughs> yeah. death punch with followed by Exhumed. And they were playing uh, uh, Take Your Vagina and Destroy It With a Sledgehammer Made of Penises, like stuff like that. I'm like, they'd be laughing at me announcing these nasty metal like the, all these, you know, death metal titles. When I was 15, I tried to like listen to the most like atrocious bands, you know, right, you like, like see you next Tuesday. Oh, and, yeah. Like I got shot in the face, you know, just like crazy, just like weird, weird ass. I, I feel like you do that though. When you're a kid, you know, oh, you totally. want to, I used to, yeah, I did. I did a lot of things just to piss people off. I was listening to a lot of free jazz back then to piss people off. <laughs> really? We would drive around my friend's Volvo with the windows up and the heat blasting in the summer in Minnesota listening to Ornette Coleman's free jazz just to be like, we're crazy and badass listening to this. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> just for half an hour of cacophony. But we were like, yeah, we're listening to this. You're sophisticated. Sophisticated, sophisticated punks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did you go to college in Florida for? Well, I guess I went for media productions, but basically I went, you know, I went for college. Yeah. You go to college for college. So you had the college experience. Yeah, I had the college experience. It was definitely uh, very much an experience. See, that's something I never had, man. I went to hair school. Uh, I graduated high school when I was 16, yeah. like early. And then I went to like, I took art classes for a year and then went to hair school. And after hair school, I, I went on tour and made music. But that was something I always, I like, I wondered about, you know? Well, see, I'm wondering about hair school. Okay. Because that sounds pretty cool. Well, uh, I worked at Starbucks and a girl used to come in and, yeah. and she would come in on like her breaks. And I one day I looked at her textbooks and I was like, what the fuck is this? And I'd like had my hair every color and like all right. this crazy shit. And so one day I looked at it and I was like, dude, I could do this. Oh, yeah. I could totally do this. And I wanted to be my own boss and I wanted to have tattoos. Uh, right. And so I quit my job and started hair school. And I was like, yes, yeah, I was like 16 and a half or 17. And I went to school with 400 girls. That's another thing. It's, it was that, awesome. That sounds like a fun environment. It it was. Yeah. Right. It was uh, a lot of drama, though. Oh, my God. It's probably nothing but drama. Oh, dude. I bet there's stuff where it's like, can we talk about maybe hair for yeah. a second and not somebody else? Dude, I <laughs> saw the craziest shit in hair school. Like, not even, I experienced it, too. Oh, like, my man. tires got slashed. My truck got keyed. What? Oh, dude. Why? Because I dated I dated girls go. that I went to school with, like a dumbass. I actually had to transfer to a different hair school. I, look, I had to leave Christ. a whole hair school yeah. and move to a different city and go to a whole nother one because I fucked it all up at the first one. Well, you created and then I fucked it all up at the second one, and that's where my tires got slashed and my truck got keyed. So you were shitting where you eat. Yeah, I was like seventeen years old, dude. I was, you know. I would have done the same thing. I was a fuck boy. I was a seventeen year old. Yeah, that term wasn't even around yet. But is that a fuck boy though? No, it's a seventeen year old kid. Right, but if, I mean, I feel like I don't know a lot of terminology. Like, I know what I know. It's something's bad and good. But I don't know exactly what does that mean exactly. I think it means <laughs> fuck boys derogatory. Oh, definitely. It sounds like you were a boy who fucks. <laughs> you were a fuck boy. I was a fox, dude. I was a fox. Yeah. yeah. And now I have gray hair. 
<laughs> so I'm a silver fox. I can't wait to get silver. Really? I got my first gray hair when I was 18, and I was like, get this shit off my fucking head. Damn. That's why you're probably so into dying. <laughs> that That's why out. I went to hair school. Yeah. That's why I went to hair school. Well, I have the opposite. Where if I have grays, you can't see them, they mix in. Okay, that's a good problem to have. I guess. I wouldn't mind some distinguished gray. Yeah, I feel like I've always had what's called a baby face. And this is yeah. the, the kind of first time in my life where people look at me as a semi-adult. You know? Yeah. I, do you ever do this? I look at basketball players and they look like full-grown humans, right? They look like... they're huge men. Yes. And I'll look at their... They'll, they'll fucking be playing and it'll be like, oh, he's 23 years old. Yeah, that's I'm 30. I'm like, dude, this guy looks like he was fucking 10 years older than me. There's a lot of dudes like that who I see who I'll, I'll meet someone and they will be, I'm like, I am 10 years older than you, but you don't realize it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Like people just talk to you like they're yeah, older. Yeah, people talk down to me all the time. It's just crazy. It's the kind of thing where like you don't understand how world weary I am to you, 21 year old who's asking for my ID. <laughs> kind of thing oh my god stuff like that or just in general when you meet someone or interact with someone who's you know is a lot younger than you but they like they don't realize they are and they kind of ask you dumb shit you're like i don't have time for this man it's ad time today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by no bull it's time to demand more from your workout gear the way you demand more from yourself no bull is a footwear apparel and accessory brand for people who train hard and don't believe in excuses and they're on a mission to create products built for people who train hard day after day Wear and tear is welcome. No Bull has you covered. They sent me two pairs of shoes. They are super, super comfortable. Don't let their simple design fool you because No Bull's gear is built to perform. They launched in 2015. They become a key disruptor in the fitness industry. Um, their philosophy is great. It's don't put anything on a product that doesn't do anything. Take everything off that you don't need. Be honest about what the product does. That reminds me of one of my favorite companies, which I really love, uh, you know, Apple, baby. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, you know, the only thing that will make you fitter is you. This is what they say. This is what I say. It sucks to go to the gym, but it's so rewarding when you're done. And products that perform with you and where you need them, that's what Noble does. Uh, like I said, the trainers, they're designed for cross-training, weightlifting, intervals, cardio, whatever else that your training can dish out. They're made with extremely durable, breathable, and abrasion-resistant material. Lightweight, flexible protection that moves the way you do. Um, their apparel is the most comfortable apparel for the most uncomfortable training. I got some of the pants. They're super great. I ride my bike in them. I run in them. I go to the gym in them. I go get groceries in them. Um, they're fundamentals and they're your new go-to workout gear. It's, uh, you know, it's simple, durable, and functional training gear. You can go visit nobleproject.com slash ADHD. Once again, nobleproject.com slash ADHD. That's N-O-B-U-L-L-P-R-O-J-E-C-T.com backslash ADHD. Uh, today's episode of the podcast is also brought to you by the ADHD Merch Shop. Go to fanjoy.co slash ADHD. Get your ADHD hoodies, sweatpants, coffee mugs, and phone cases. Some a good friend of mine, Byron Bowers, is an amazing comic. We were sitting with some people one day, and he was some guy was joshing me about Josh. I, said, I was just joshing. Say, he, said, he was Josh. It's like a fucking Minnesota thing. Oh, he was fucking joshing me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Quit joshing me, Joel. The soda's coming out. Fucking soda. Some guy was like asking me some shit, like, man, how old are you? And he, he interjected. He was like, look in his eyes, man. Is he flinching when you look at him? No. Don't ask him how. Don't ask him that question. He doesn't <laughs> give a shit. He doesn't have time for that. I was like, that's such a great perspective. It's a thing where, like, I just don't give. I'm old enough to not give a shit. It's the kind of thing where I always think of uh, the best way, if you don't want to get carded, this is like if you're like a fucking teen. You want oh, a yeah. Drink? So put, put them on. If you want, hey, teens, if you want to get a, a beer or get a drink at a bar, oh, shit. you don't want to get carded. Oh, shit. What you do is you walk up to the bar and you act real tired and you go, can I just get a, <laughs> can I just get a Negroni, please? If you order a Negroni, they'll be like, they'll uh, never, you never get carded if you order a Negroni. What's a Negroni? Exactly. I don't even know. A what Negroni that is. is gin, Campari, and vermouth in equal parts. What the fuck is Campari? It's an Italian. Uh, it's like a. It's like a red. I don't even know what it is. It's a vermouth. Thing. It's like a bitter. Okay. Gin, Campari, vermouth, equal parts. So it's, it's like super, a geriatric drink. It's very strong. If you order, if you order a, 
what I just said. A Negroni, you won't get carded because they know like, oh, for one, it tastes terrible. <laughs> it's super bitter and nasty. So you would never drink that. It's like if you order a, what's it called? A fucking uh, whiskey sour. That's like the fake ID drink. Okay. If you order a Negroni, equal parts, not not up, served on the rocks, you'll never get carded. Negroni stock just went up. Except it's a drink, so I don't have a stock. Yeah, but just... Campari stock. How about just that? invest in Campari. Invest in Campari. Maybe. I don't even think they can invest. If they're fucking taking your advice to go get fucking free drinks <laughs> underage, they're not gonna they're not gonna be on the stock market. I just recently did that, by the way. What you the, got in the stock market? Yeah, I got in the stock market like a month ago. Should I bring my mic closer like yours? Yeah, sure. Should we get tighter? Yeah, I mean these are SM7s, baby. Oh, these are the great mics. Michael I love Jackson them. recorded thriller on this microphone. Did not you know this that? one? Like that literally <laughs> that one. Oh god. I bought it for the guest <laughs> podcast, dude. His glove oh is god. underneath your fucking seat, dude. <laughs> it's gonna eject your shit and shoot me out the goddamn window. <laughs> um oh my god. I felt so cool when I bought one of these. I was like 18 and I was like, dude, uh -huh. this is the Michael Jackson microphone. You can record thriller on this. Oh, hell yeah. And uh, all the music I made on it sucked. So I, I soon realized it was not the microphone. You gotta have that roll off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know that guy, you know Al Green, right? Of course. His producer, uh, Willie Mitchell. There's a great article with him from years ago where Willie Mitchell was, uh, he produced all those high records albums, all of Al Green stuff, all of like, uh, God, what's his name? I'm forgetting so many people. Everyone on high records in the 60s and 70s, Willie Mitchell produced most of it. And Willie Mitchell was a fucking badass, right? Like a real gangster motherfucker in Memphis. And he had these preamps. The high records were recorded in an old movie theater in Memphis. Uh, that was the recording studio. They alt they altered it to be a recording studio. So it had like these heavy cement floors. It probably and, like sloped down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's they recorded all those Al Green albums. Damn. And he had these two big power amps, like these big fucking ancient tube power amps. And that's sort of what he gives credit to having that that's that warmth and that strength in all those songs. Michael Jackson at some point in the late nineties, I think, or maybe I'm trying to think what happened when this was, but he wanted to buy those power amps from Willie Mitchell. He offered them like a hundred times what they're worth. And Willie Mitchell was like, fuck no, motherfucker. I'm not selling you these. <laughs> Cause it's like, you can't buy my shit. So MJ never got the power amps. He never got those power amps. No, they're still probably there. He did buy Eminem's like fucking music uh, royalties. He did? When they were beefing, yeah. I think he bought wow. Eminem's like publishing. What if? What a crazy undercutted, undercutting thing to do to someone. You so think like, so? Okay, because look, here's this thing, right? That's happening right now. They're beefing, right? Scooter Braun. No, when they were like, I mean, like Eminem was like dissing Michael Jackson yeah, a while. So yeah, so yeah. I'll, I'll buy him out. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but Scooter Braun, Justin Bieber's manager, just bought Taylor Swift's, and Taylor Swift went on Twitter like today. But how did you yesterday just buy her royalties though? If the all right, look, you, if you're an artist, you sign a record deal, right? Yeah. And like, you know, uh, a, a record label owns the rights to your music. Okay, right. they own those records, depending on whatever you know. This is dependent upon the contract that you sign. Yeah. Someone can then come along once a term or a period is is over and the rights holder can be like, yo, I'll right. sell you. I'll sell you what we have. For an amount of money. For an amount of money. Correct. Like pretty much transfer ownership of the copyright. Yeah. Uh, That's a lot of money. It's crazy, right? And so like the first thought is that it's fucked up. But on second thought, you made the decision to do it in the first mm -hmm. place. And then it's just a transfer of ownership from the people who took a bet on you. Yeah. So it's kind of like, ugh, it's, it's, it's incestuous and it's sticky it's and nasty. it's gross, but it's the music business. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not very good. You know, nasty. I've heard, I've heard things, but I just, di I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't know if they were true or not. Yeah. I heard it was kind of nasty. It's gotten better though. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's definitely better than it used to be like in the fifties and sixties and stuff. hundred percent. Um, yeah, I feel like now artists around the world just have more, I want to say opportunity. Maybe control and power. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, there's more ownership, but at the same time, the price of entry, uh, you know, anyone can upload a song. Anyone can make a song. Right. Uh, so now, you know, you're just competition is sky high. Yeah, it's true. It's that it's like that directly proportional graph where there's more opportunity, but there's with that more opportunity becomes more competition. So, which we were talking about before the podcast too, but there, it feels like there's so much music to listen to. Yeah. I, I really find that I, I can't keep up. People send me 
I do a podcast. I basically talk about music only. And people send me stuff all the time. And I kind of realized the other day that um, I can listen to something and like it right away if I haven't decided to take time to listen to it. But I realize the stuff that I like the most is stuff that has context for me personally. And it's so hard to break into that thing to have to have context because I already have so much music I've listened to that has so much context that there's not a lot of room left for me to find new music that has context. Like if, if my friend Steve in Minnesota sends me him like a two minute song of him playing on his guitar, I will love it because it's like, I know Steve for 20 years. And, and will you listen to that over and over again? I listen to it a lot. Because really? It has, it has like this thing where it's like, you know, I can hear when I'm hearing it, I'm not just hearing the sounds and the music I'm hearing. Like it's sort of like our relationship. It's like a thing where I know who's playing the music. I feel like when you know who's making music, it means 10 times more to you than music you just hear. Because obviously, you can hear music all the goddamn time. You can listen to sounds. You can listen to music 24 hours a day, but it, it could mean nothing to you. But you know, when you like, I feel like there's a difference between listening to music and hearing music. I listen to music yeah. a lot, but when I hear it, it's like, ugh. Yo, I've been thinking about this a lot. It's crazy that you just, you put that... You've put what I've been thinking about into words, right? Because well, it took me a long time to figure this out. And and because I remember the feeling I got when I would be like friends with local bands, right? And I'd have yes. their I'd have their demos and I'd listen to them over and over and over. Right. And then we'd go play shows together. And uh I was driving down a street. I was in my hometown this weekend, and uh there's this there's this like little shopping center called Brockton Arcade. And okay. my friends, they they named their band Brockton Arcade. Right. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, how how can I go listen to that album? And I can't. Because there's just a four fucking not, track demo it. and it was on a CD. And I was like, fuck, people, do people even like go through that anymore? Like, do they have experiences like that? And I don't listen to music that my friends make anymore. I mean, like, you know, it's not like a, yeah. a special thing. I have friends who make music and I can go on, on Spotify or Apple and listen to it. But it does take away that like special, you know, mm -hmm. personal feel. I don't know. So send, yeah. send, send your music to your friends, people, totally. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's so great because something when you you know a person who makes it, it just has such a, I, I mean the, the word I always say is context because it's like you have, you just know who's making it so it just you understand every nuance or if you don't understand it it's colored by that knowledge. Damn, I just feel like a shitty friend now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because if my friend sent me music, I'll listen to it, but not I won't like. You know, but sometimes it's also hard though, because your friend sends it to you, and it's and bad. You, and you think like, I don't want to listen to it. It hurts mm. to listen to something that you don't like. Who's someone you love made? A lot of times, I won't watch someone's TV show, who I, a friend of mine, just because like I don't want to have an opinion on this thing because I love this person. I just don't. I kind of can tell. I don't think I'm gonna like this. I'm pretty good at like sniffing out what I'm gonna like and what I'm not gonna like. And if I think I'm not going to like something, I don't want to have an opinion that's negative. I'd rather just be like, I haven't seen it. Don't know. Damn. Well, thanks for doing this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy, man. Yeah. I, I, uh, I guess I kind of do the same thing. Yeah. So it's just, there's so much stuff. I can become to. a fan of a lot of things though. That's, that's one thing like, and, and for me, I, I feel like there has to be some kind of like, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say prescription diagnosis for the, right. for what I have, but I, I get obsessed with things really easily. Uh, yeah. Right. And so like so I, Mark Twain, yeah. <laughs> he writes about it. Mark Twain. I remember reading this passage in, uh, Mark Twain's book, innocence, no, a tramp abroad where he's in Europe and he's talking about when he was climbing the Alps with a friend doing all the, like, he's writing all about it. It's like a travel log. And he talks about some sentence. I'm going to butcher this, but he basically says, is there nothing better in the world than a new obsession? Mm. And this is Mark Twain, like an 18, I don't know, 1855. He became obsessed with mountain climbing overnight. I was like, that's me. That is, no, dude, yeah. that is me. Like, you know, and look, I feel like I have a lot of skills, right? And I have a lot of hobbies yeah. and like, that's what like makes my life fun. But at some points it is like, it affects my sleep and it affects oh, like yeah. my work. And like, I, you know, I, I'll, if I get fixated on something, I won't want to like go do other things. And, 
And then I get stressed out about like, okay, well, what do I want to do? I want to ride my bike today or do I want to go do this today or do totally. I want to like work on this? It, it, and I feel like it's, you know, it's part of my ADHD, but yeah, man, I almost have a nervous breakdown the other day because I couldn't figure out where to plant my fucking strawberries because <laughs> I get so obsessed. What with were, my well, what were your options? Well, that's the problem. Okay. You had too many. There's so many options. <laughs> well, were you going to plant? How do you grow? Do you just plant them in the ground or is it like oh. a planter or do you hang them or? Everything you're saying is all part Wrong. of the problem. Oh, okay. It's like, what do you I? You could do it all. I've got so many places. Oh, the sun. Do I want morning sun? Evening sun. I want this. I've got three varieties. And they're just sitting there. They got to get in the ground soon. Can you grow them on a wall? Oh, I could, but I don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah. That'd be, see, my, uh, my homie Dave is really into gardening. I am not, um, but he takes care of all the plants around the house and he has okay. like fucking wind chimes that he makes out of seashells and like nice. he, he has a plant that he made out of a van's shoe. He didn't make a plant. He made a, he, he grew a plant. A plant yeah. He planted shoe, yeah. a plant in a pair of vans and it is now a big fucking plant coming out nice. of a fucking van. I want to see that. It's cra- I'll send you a picture of it cool. when I get home. Yeah, dude. Uh, I feel like you two would really get along. Yeah, we could obsess about the same things. About planting, yeah. gardening. Gardening is- My girlfriend's dad is, is obsessed with it too. They live in Washington. Washington State? Uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah, like, yeah, you can grow a lot there. Dude. <laughs> you can do You've a lot. done your research. Well, you can't. Any, anytime you're in like a Don't coastal you climate. you talk about it, dude. It's predatory. It's, it's definitely. It's, it's predatory. Yeah, you can grow a lot there. You can grow a lot in Washington yeah. State. You could probably do a pretty nice zygota on the yeah. on the uh, on the bay there because you get a lot of moisture. I don't know what the fuck that means. Oh, a Psych- fishtail palm, a zygota. Oh, that's a great tree. There's one on Beverly Glen. I've been watching for years. <laughs> it was a nice Wagandia urine. Oh, do you mm-hmm. mountain bike? Because that would be good if you like nature and shit. I used to mountain bike in Minnesota when I grew up. Uh, I haven't done it in a while. I got my friend Davis is kind of like me and he uh, just got obsessed with mountain biking recently yeah. and so he went and got a bike and we've been going nonstop. but really uh, really just puts you in the middle of it and takes you mm-hmm. away from everything and that's what I've been doing it almost every day dude and it just fucking clears my head yeah I like I like hiking and backpacking a lot like I'm probably gonna go maybe tomorrow or the next day to go up meet up with a friend in Yosemite and we'll go out for like three or four nights oh damn just to pack he's like a a true guy like he works up there he counts endangered uh reptiles for the usgs so he like knows everything in and out so he has to like tag reptiles when he's working yeah he, he finds them and counts them and takes pictures of them and to to monitor the population because they're endangered yeah so he does that for a living so he's up and down the mountains all the time so when he's off he still likes to hike and i'll go with him and he's like the, the best guide ever so I bet. he'll take me up there and i just will follow him just the other night i was hiking by myself i was thinking like what if I was with him and he died? I would fucking die too because I wouldn't know how to get out of there. I think about that sometimes when I ride my bike and I'm like, God yeah. damn, like, dude, if anything goes wrong right now, I'm fucked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, well, dude, we should probably talk about, you know, what you're about to embark on and, oh, yeah. and kind of the whole reason why you're here. But, you know, you are a really funny guy and you're a comedian and right. uh, you're about to hit the road. I'm going to hit the road, probably a little plane there. Just playing in road, no train. Okay, yeah. okay. Just playing in road. Yeah, I'm in doing road. shows in Chicago, Eau Claire, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Des Moines, Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Baltimore, D.C. I think one more. I, can't I cannot believe yeah. you got that all memorized. I've been saying it so goddamn much. Okay. So, yeah, July 15th, I start in Chicago at the at the hideout, and then I'll be, you can check all my dates out on my website. It's johnnypemberton.dog. Dot dog? Dot dog. Someone someone sniped my name and I was like, I'm not going to pay someone to get it back. So, Dot dog. I didn't know you could do dot dog. I know. That's Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's great. Johnny Pemberton dot dog. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, uh, you, you will not forget that one. Exactly. Do you have a name for your tour? Uh, not this one, actually. I usually name the tours, but this one I've sort of been calling it just Johnny Pemberton Live. It's been co-sponsored by... Uh, Goldman Sachs and Halliburton. So <laughs> should be successful. Yeah, I put a it bunch of do well. <laughs> <laughs> did you make fake ads? I did. Okay, we, we had Goldman Sachs and Halliburton. You can see it. Oh yeah. my god. Um, you also have this thing on your YouTube. Uh, I'm sorry, Dick. Dick or Troy. Dick or Troy. Yeah, it's a character I do from time to time. I urge everyone to go watch those YouTube videos. Um, yes. Tell everyone about Dicker. Well, Dicker is a uh, he's a union driver. He's a transpo captain. He's been working in motion pictures for about 37 years. He was born in Bakersfield on a charcoal farm. (laughs) 
I'm from Riverside, so Bakersfield hits yeah. that hits that spot. Bakersfield is somehow even dirtier. Yeah, it's it's methy. Let's just, methy. Yeah. It's smoggy. Yeah. It's nasty. Shitty. Yeah. And he was born on a charcoal farm. He left the charcoal farm and started driving. And he's got a ponytail, dark glasses, and a very deep voice. So he's a. I do a show with my friend Josh Fade, and we do it once a month at the Satellite in Silver Lake. It's called Kiss My Ass. Yeah, because Dicker likes to say kiss my ass a lot. So. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask, is he making an appearance on your tour? He might, actually. I've done him in the past, but um, I'm not sure if he will this time. I'm not sure. But he's, I, he's, he's streaming on Twitch a lot. Got you it. You go to Twitch. I think it's uh, Twitch TV. I am Dicker Troy. You go to YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash just my nipples. You are, uh, <laughs> yo, the next time I need a fucking URL, I'm hitting you up, dude. Yeah, man. I'm like, yo, what's my, uh, I'm on, I'm on Wix right now. What should my next website be? The best is telling people that and then t- them being scared to say it out loud after me. Like it's, uh, it's just my nipples. Like, okay. It's, um, <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah. Yep. Um, I liked and I subscribed. Yes. Uh, how did you, how did you find out you were funny, man? Like when did this whole comedy thing for you start? Dude, I don't even know. I think. It was something where I didn't think about it so much. It was more just I liked being an idiot and fooling around and goofing off. I think the first time I wrote was like had sort of independent confirmation of it was I was sleeping over at my friend Matt's house and I was joking around at the breakfast table the next day with it was a bunch of us like slept over there and we were just I was acting the fool just making fun of like the Minnesota accent because even though if you live in Minnesota you can still make fun of how people talk. Okay. And, uh, hold on. But do you get mad if non Minnesotians make fun of the accent? I don't give a shit. Okay. Cause my mom's from Louisiana. So I have this weird thing where I grew up hating Minnesota cause she would talk so much shit about it. So there's a weird thing. Like I live here and I grew up here, but you think Minnesota is terrible cause you're from Louisiana. So I'm like, ah, who am I? So I was making fun of the Minnesota accent. I think, I think I was making his mom laugh a ton. And the next day, I grew up in Rochester, Minnesota. It's a very small town. And so I think uh, she saw my dad at work. And she was said, my dad came home from work and said, hey, what's this about, about you being funny? I'm like, I don't know. What do you mean? Like, I saw I saw Mrs. W. And she said uh, that you were being really funny. That you, were being, you were making them laugh a lot at, at breakfast when you slept over there. What is, what's that all about? I was like, I don't know. I was just joking around. <laughs> and it's like, I guess... That was to me was okay, so that's like a thing. But I mean, at the same time, I also always wanted to do comedy. But there's a thing where she grew up in a small town, and in the Midwest, it's like a thing where it doesn't seem like a like a real thing, like a real possible thing to do. If you said you wanted to be a comedian, they'd be like, oh, oh yeah, real, really you want to be a fucking comedian, that dude. Same, yeah, same okay. where I grew up, man. In music, yeah. it, I, I thought record deals only happened in movies. Totally, you know. But I mean, it's like a thing where you meet people who grew up in that environment and they're like, yeah, this is, it's a normal thing. You can, if you work really hard and want to do it, you don't have to even be that funny. You can just work hard and do something. (laughs) Yeah. If you work hard at anything, you can probably make a living at it. But if you, yeah, if you're like, if your brain's corrupt enough and you had enough experiences to sort of warp you, if like it makes you seek out comedy because comedy is such a, uh, it's such like a like a salve for problems in your life. Because mm. I, I was always really sick when I was growing up. I had ulcerative colitis, which is like a bowel disease. Okay. I think part of that probably came from me trying to um, like not think about that or distract people from maybe if I have to go to the bathroom a lot. Like that's a really embarrassing thing to have to go to the bathroom a lot. At least when you're a kid it is because that's like a thing where – you feel very embarrassed about bodily functions, even though it's the most natural thing ever yeah. and you can totally own it. But as a kid, you're like, well, I don't want to fart. I don't want to be, people know I'm taking a shit. And I think that part of it was that was like, I just found this way to, um, like a defense mechanism or sort of a way to ease, uh, what's it called? Like discomfort. hundred kind percent. Of yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I'm always fascinated by like process and like how comedians create material. So is it, are you like, is it experiences? And then like you're, you, you know, you're sitting down and like writing it out. Is it like stuff that you, that 
Yeah. You're kind of mulling over for a long time and then it just comes out on stage. Like, do you, I, you know, forgive me, but do you free, is it like freestyle? Like, do you I ever mean, do sets where you just go up and, and, and improv a whole set? Totally. For me, that's, that's what I do best is improvising. And, uh, that's how I quote unquote write is I usually write on stage. Damn. I have something I'm, I've been thinking about it. Like it's been in my, I've been ruminating on a thing. Then when I go up there, a lot of times, like the stakes of the stage force you to uh, create your best shit. Right, create your best shit. It's like a thing where a lot of times, what's the most frustrating thing about doing comedy is that a lot of times the first time you do something is the best. Damn. And so the hardest thing is to get over, at least for people who are like me, because I feel like comedy has a spectrum where there's people who are writers and people who are performers. And some people are amazing writers and they're not, they don't do a whole lot of performing. Uh, those people I'm super jealous of. I think that they're super great and funny and, but I just can't do that. And there's some people who are purely performance. It's like Robin Williams is purely performance, right? He's like this frenetic ball of energy and yeah. all that stuff going on. And you have someone like, I mean, this isn't totally true, but I feel like Stephen Wright is someone whose his writing is so strong and so interesting and he's so slow that you have to be like, huh? and he just, the punchline comes like, oh my God, it's so funny because it's so well written. And I think most comics are somewhere Would you say like between. Anthony Jeselnik is? Jeselnik's totally that. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. was just saying, see, it's like, you know, talk about my contemporaries. It's sort of, it feels weird. So yeah, Jeselnik is. He, exactly he just like put that. out a special, uh, yeah. Fire in the Maternity Award. It's, it's so fucking funny. hilarious. Yeah. I've known Jeselnik for a long time. His guy's he's he's great. great. He's so funny. I'm a big fan. And he's like that style. And I feel like, all comics are somewhere in between. Some of them are very far one way or another. I tend to be really performative because that's the stuff I like to do the most is characters and like moving stuff and just things that are, that aren't just writing. And I actually have a lot of trouble repeating things that are, are written, but just because it feels like contrived. Yeah. It feels yeah. contrived and it feels like it's not in the moment addressing the situation. So the stuff I like to do the most a lot of times is not um, at all, um, like I know where I'm going to go. I know I'm going to start, but I don't know what's going to happen in between. So at the end of your tour, we talked about this, but you're, you're right. eventually going to record a special, right? Yeah. So when you walk on stage, like to record a special, is it just like, you know, a free for all, or is it going to be like things that you've, that you've toured? It's going to be probably a combination of it. It's going to be a lot of stuff that I have done a bunch and that I like, but there'll probably be new elements of it every time I perform it, that will... Nuances. Like yeah, little. nuances. There's also like a big part of comedy too is interacting with people. And that's why if anytime I watch, because I know, you know, obviously I know a lot of comedians from performing a Being long time. Scene, yeah, of course. And you, anytime, there's some of, my, some of my favorite comedians that exist and people who've made me laugh in ways where like I just will never, I'll never forget. It's the kind of thing, if you see, you know, if you see someone do something really good, they you're like, I'll always remember how doesn't matter what that person does. Yep. Doesn't matter if they're living in the gutter. I'm like, I always remember that one time that this thing where yep. it blew me away. There's probably like five or 10 people who I think that of where they made me laugh in a way that's so intense and pure that they'll never be anything but the funniest people ever. And so I see some of those people's recordings and you watch it and it's just, it's just not there because the medium of comedy really isn't, it's not meant to be recorded. It's a thing where it's live. You can try your best and there's some people are better at recording, but the people who are really great at performing, the people who are like just a pure dynamo and interact with someone. I think Todd Glass is an example. Todd Glass, I've seen him live so many times. He's, I mean, he's like a treasure, right? But there's nothing Todd Glass could record. I'm not saying anything against Todd Glass, but there's nothing he could record that could ever match the energy and the interactive spirit of a live performance. Because there's just something about it when you're present with another human being where this thing, you can record it, but there's something that won't make it to the tape that's happening in that moment that feels so good to everybody that is just, it's you can't describe it and you can't record it. It's like this podcast. Exactly. I'm, I'm coming right now, <laughs> but they're not going to understand it. 
They won't see you because you're wearing jeans. <laughs> no, that's why we wear jeans. But that's yo, on stage, it was just impro- like, it must feel so good when you get it, like when you nail it, right? Like it just, you must be, you must walk off stage like intoxicated. Oh my God. It's the greatest feeling. Right. People after a show will say, thank you so much. I'm like, you had a quarter of the fun I had. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad for you because there's no way in hell you had as much fun as I did. It's not even possible. But as a comedian, there's also those nights where you bomb. Yeah, everyone bombs. And it's the thing where, oh, should I kill myself now or 10 minutes from now? It's terrible. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I feel like it's, uh, I've had awful shows, dude, where like, you know, awful, been booed. There's been four people in the crowd. You have to, though. You know, and and you got to fucking just slug through it. And I feel like those moments, though, are what builds character. Right. And it's yeah. going to like, that's going to show you your true self in those shitty, in the shittiest of times. Right. It, it's, it's so hard to get through that stuff, but if you can, then it's such a, yeah, it's such a character building thing. And yeah, it's just, it's a normal, it's what makes someone do that and not a normal person. I think it's what separates the people who do it for, just for like bullshit reasons, right? From the yeah. people, like from the people who really fucking love it. Yeah, because you have to do it. If I didn't, do, I don't know what else I'd do. Like it's too late. I was gonna, I'm I was gonna this. say, if you weren't doing comedy, is there anything else that you would be doing? I don't know. I mean, gardening. Maybe gardening. Maybe being like the world's funniest doctor <laughs> <laughs> who hates himself because he's not doing what he wants to do. Oh my god! That's a doctor a- wants to be a stand-up comedian. Oh yeah, because you'd be like a doctor, but you'd be. You wouldn't be fulfilled. You'd be, you would just hate yourself. You have to tell people that they're dying, but you want to like crack yeah. a joke. Maybe that's when you crack the joke is when they're dying. You tell them like, well, you tell them, I don't know. I can't think of how you do it exactly. I would say, um, excuse me. So here's the deal. Uh, your legs got to come off. I'm just kidding. Actually, you, you keep your legs, but you're going to die. <laughs> that would be it right there. That's fucked. Yeah. That is fucked. It would be fucked. Jesus Christ. You know, everyone would just say, take the leg. And I would say, you know, oh, this, it's not, it doesn't work that way. This isn't a, a trade off. You know what I thought was so crazy when I was a little kid is like, you know, Bob Marley, how he died because like he wouldn't amputate his toe. Oh, that's right. He did tie um, that. Huh? And I was like, dude, that's so crazy. Like, why wouldn't you just fucking do that? I'm 30 now and I have to get two of my wisdom teeth removed. Mm-hmm. And I'm finding every fucking excuse humanly possible not to go and make that appointment to get them removed. Yeah. And it's fucking my mouth up, right? Like I got headaches and shit. It's like, it's bad for my teeth. Like I've been supposed to, I've been, I, I got to get them out. It sucks. I've had major abdominal surgery, but I hated having my wisdom teeth taken out. You're lying. Out. Oh, don't tell More. me that. Well, here's why. It's don't tell it's me It's in that. your mouth. Yeah. So you know what I mean? It's like if someone's going to cut off my hands, at least I can go, oh, my hands are being cut off. Oh. But someone's fucking my mouth. I'm like, oh, 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 oh. you know what I mean? It's oh, like, dude. Yeah. Oh, what you- am I in for? What am I? Oh, you want to know what else I heard? They don't fucking put people, they don't give you laughing gas no more. You want laughing gas? I don't. I don't know. I want whatever is gonna make it go by. You wanna go under? No, because uh, they Why? said that shit's dangerous. Well, yeah, it's dangerous, but what isn't? Yeah, I don't. I guess you're right. You're not gonna die. Okay. If you did die, you'd be like, wow, this is guy. He's the guy who died while getting his wisdom teeth taken out. <laughs> what a fucking tombstone. Yeah. What a tombstone. You won't die. Have them put you under. Tell them you're super nervous and you need something called verset right beforehand. Okay. That's the key to life. Great. Because they were like, yeah, we're just going to numb you up and they'll take like 10 minutes. And no, you want to go down. Okay. And tell them to, <laughs> you pu- go tell them to push that plunger you slow. You want to go down. Just slip the anesthesiologist a hundred bucks. Say, push that plunger nice and slow, buddy. Does it change if it goes slow? Yeah, because if sometimes I've, I've gone under and it's like five, four, <sighs> you don't get to enjoy it. Oh man! I, I know. See, I'm scared of that too, well, dude. I want to feel like the slow. I'm drift, scared like, of like. <laughs> hey man, I like those clothes too. Oh, who's that? You know, just really make a <laughs> fool of myself for a good five minutes. I'm scared of what I am liable to say or do. You will while I'm under that I fucking got in trouble. medic. Did you? I got in trouble twice. I got in trouble once when I had the major surgery when I had my colon taken out. Oh, how old were you? I think I was 19 or 20. Okay. 
And I was coming out of anesthesia in the recovery room and I was in a lot of pain, but I was also really out of it. And I was screaming, I was cursing. I was like, fuck it, shit, fuck it, fuck it, fuck it. And it's super bright lights. It's a recovery room. It's bright as fuck. They come and they put some uh, probably morphine into my IV. I could see him doing it. And I thought they were pretending to do it because I was so out of it. I was like, because I was still in pain and I was so out of it. I thought they were pretending to put it in. I was like, you're fucking pretending to put that in. <laughs> you st- I probably called her a bitch. I probably oh said something. T- I mean, I said terrible stuff. I was cursing. <laughs> That's what I'm scared of. And, I was, and, they, and they, at one point, she came, one of the nurses came by and said, Mr. Pemberton, you have to stop cursing or we're going to have to take you out of the recovery room. <laughs> it's so Imagine they just drop you off on the curb. They're just, <laughs> bye. Oh, man. That was oh. embarrassing, but that happened just because anesthesia, there's a thing that happens evidently with certain people, a certain percentage of men have a adverse reaction to anesthesia. It makes them super aggressive. That's the reason when they trank animals, like a, like a trank dart for a lion, Okay, let's say let's say a lion weighed the same amount as me, which would okay. never happen. It'd be a sick lion, but to trank a lion, you have to take ten times the amount it takes to trank a human. Not ten times; it's some number because the animals have to be so encumbered with the drug, otherwise they fucking rage out. Really? So if you half trank an animal, it just turns them into a berserker because they're like, ah, I'm so pissed because I'm, I feel like this chemical is trying to kill me. So they just go nuts. So like, adrenaline ah, and all yeah. of that. Uh, you know what I'm more nervous about though is if I do go down and then I wake up, but I like don't wake, like, like I'm awake while they're doing but it, can't move. but I can't move. That's why I don't want to do that shit. Nah, that never happens. That never Dude, happens. Oh, I, I've definitely read a whole bunch of things that that's happened. Well, when? Like, <laughs> I feel like Vice Vice has some article yeah, about Vice, it. Yeah, Vice definitely has a thing. <laughs> this one guy one time one woke t- up. <laughs> we don't know his name or where he lived, but it happened. He woke up and he couldn't. He t- won't talk to us, but we can confirm. Yeah. Um, okay, well, you just uh, convinced me to get knocked the fuck out for my wisdom Get teeth. knocked out and do it ASAP. It's crazy because, do it ASAP. Yeah, because it's the thing, it's only going to get worse. I'm going to have to do it in like three weeks. Uh, definitely going to take a week off from the pod. Hey, just mm-hmm. warning you now. Um, okay. Uh, I was, I wasn't going to do it. I was super right. like, fuck this now. Now I'm going to, but half of the people tell me it's the easiest thing in the world. And the half of the people tell me stories like yours. I don't know. Some people have it easy. I think I just, uh, I think I got dry sockets maybe that. Okay. That's another thing. I can't smoke weed for two weeks. Yeah. You can't smoke weed for two weeks. That's or, probably good though. Or I'll get dry socket. And I don't even know what that is, but you can't, you can't do that. Infection. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can't no, drink out of a straw. Shouldn't drink out of a straw because it creates negative pressure in your mouth and it'll suck the scab tissue out of the socket. God damn. You know a too. lot, man. I know so much about medicine. It's, it's ridiculous. That's nice. I yeah. am a hypochondriac, so I might be texting you a whole lot. I'm like, the opposite. Oh, really? Yeah. I have a thing where anything I can think anything is nothing. Jesus Christ. Like, I don't know what it is. I think it's because of having an illness for so long mm. to having, to being doted on so much about something to where now I'm like, everything is just, well, it's true though, that a lot of things that are people, problems people have physically are caused by stress. I believe it. And it's a thing, it's hard to kind of know what is what, but if you do start from a place thinking, okay, so if my mind is affecting my body and my mind is all stressed out, then why my body is going to feel the same way. And if you, you can't break that cycle, then you'll have like a lot of problems. Like back pain is a big thing with that. Uh, a lot of bowel diseases are that. And so a lot of times, not a lot of time, I mean, I, I guess a part of me thinks that some of my issues with colitis and stuff could have been mitigated by something other than really strong medicines mm. and just changing my diet and maybe meditating or something, but it was something where people weren't into that back then. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, dude, I had anxiety when no one knew what a panic attack was, yeah. you know, and I got admitted to the hospital for heart attacks. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, I totally feel that. But what's crazy too is like when I'm depressed or like I'm not active, my body hurts a lot more. And when I'm active and when I'm taking care oh of myself, my God, yeah. I can, I, dude, I can run four miles a day and, you know, my knee doesn't bother me. 
Totally. It's so weird. Like what, like mind, body, soul, that shit lines up. It has to be, you know, you got to take care of, of, of every piece of yourself. And, and I definitely, uh, I've learned that in my last three years, you know, of being alive, quit smoking when I was, uh, 27, yeah. uh, cigarettes. Smoking's not good. Uh, no. And I smoked for, you know, since I was 15. Oh yeah. But now you're good though. Now I'm good. I have this app. It tells me how much money I've saved. Tells me like, you know, how many days I've added back onto my life. Totally. How many cigarettes I haven't smoked. I've saved like yeah. 12 grand. Wow. I smoked a lot. It like, yeah. <laughs> it was like a pack and a half a day. Smoking's, man, that shit's nasty. You never smoke cigarettes? I smoke occasionally. I'll smoke like once a week. Oh, okay. Which I feel like. I See, dude, I've never been able to do that. I know. I I'm an all or thing. nothing. I'm an all or nothing guy. I'm yeah. like, like I said, when I, when I like something, I mean, yeah, look, once again, look at me. Like I have one, one tattoo. Really? Where? Right here. Okay. I thought you were going to be like tramp stamp. <laughs> That's nice. You got it for a character or something. Ooh, that'd be good, actually. If you get a tattoo, dude, that's fucking, that is commitment. I'm going to start doing that. Yeah? Might as well. Okay. Like, I mean. Hold on. Do you become the bit? I love getting into character. Like, yeah. If I get into character, I will talk to my best friends. I'm like, I'm not budging. When I get into character, it's like, I just love it. To me, getting into character to me is like the most, it's the greatest feeling that there is because you are. You don't have to be yourself. It's like the 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 most. It's the cheapest and the least uh, consequences in terms of taking a step outside of yourself. Yeah. Like if I do a character anytime, I just it just feels so good. It's like you're time traveling and you know all the answers to everything, and you can just be, you can say anything because I'm not. I didn't say that. This guy said it. And you know, I just I don't know something about it. I just I love fucking love it. And how long does it take for you to create a character? Oh, I don't know. A lot of times it just starts with a voice. To me, it's like a voice thing. It's usually like one or two words. And it's maybe like a very specific uh, phrase. It's an impression of a, of a common idea. Like saying something, I don't know, just like not knowing some, something that everybody knows. Like it'd be a guy who like, yep, I've never had rice. <laughs> Be like that. Okay. Something where everyone's had rice. Yeah, well, I haven't. So, yeah, I also uh, don't wear shoes. I just wear a lot of socks. You know, it's just, I don't know. It's like a thing. That's not a character you have. No, that's my friend Davis. Yeah. Friend yeah, yeah. Just wear socks, no shoes. Yeah. Tons of socks. Tons, tons, uh, tons of socks. Oh, never mind. He wears, he wears shoes, no socks. Oh, okay. That actually feels pretty good. Yeah. I, I was doing it earlier today. Especially new shoes. Threw, threw some fucking, threw some socks on for this podcast. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. The worst is, dude, is yeah, you got, you know, it's, you can ruin a good pair of shoes with no socks. You can, but you can also really enjoy that pair of shoes. <laughs> for two days. Yeah. Oh, I think back on when I was 18 and oh. some of the fucking... Oh, some of the pairs is just the way that I wore shoes. Oh, just disgusting. I was the opposite. I was such a sock boy. Really? It's like a fuck boy, but for socks. <laughs> Back when I was I growing got up. all the socks. I couldn't imagine not wearing socks. Oh, really? Oh, oh my no, God. dude. I was budget. I was like, I was just, I well, was that's barely, California I was too. barely hanging on. Yeah, I was Vans, no socks, oh, just yeah. fucking ugh, girl jeans. Damn. Like ripped out, just disgusting vans i wore one pair of shoes one like i feel like for like two years all you california people make me so jealous because you like you grow up like my wife's that way because she grew up in the in that nine area she knew about stuff when she was 13 that i didn't find out about until i was like 22 really just like bands everything there's you guys are so much more advanced culturally advanced than people who grew up in the midwest i feel yeah i agree yeah I just feel like you, we just, there's just like so much access. Like, dude, you could drive to LA, yeah. you know, when you're fucking 13 years old. So you could see like, oh, I just saw, I saw, uh, I don't know, the gun club. Like, yeah, I'm over them. It's like, they're the coolest band ever. And you're over them? Yeah, I'm more into this now. I have a sick gun club shirt at uh, <sighs> my house. One of the greatest bands of all time. Yeah. Um, dude, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, Very fun. Pff, almost an hour already. Uh, why don't you tell everyone where to find you, man? You can go to Instagram. It's Johnny underscore Pemberton. You can go to website, which is Johnny Pemberton dot dog. dog. <laughs> you can go to Twitter, which is just my name again, or you can go to 
YouTube, where I put all my videos. It's youtube.com slash just my nipples. Jesus Christ. And you can see me on tour in July. Yes, sir. Um, man, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, once again, thank you. Yeah. Hey, yeah, motherfuckers. Come on my podcast. Yeah, I'm down. ASAP. We'll Make do it, it happen. Um, go to hey, Fanjoy. Fuckers. Hey, fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Go to fanjoy.co slash ADHD. Get your fucking merch. I love you guys. See you next week. Peace. It's ADHD.